I'm Chris Fanta. Um, and <laughs> um, Chris is on his way to St. Lucia. Um, and while he really wanted to be here, we told him that we thought it was probably more important that he and his wife go to St. Lucia. But um, so I'm, I'm going to introduce um, the esteemed panel and, um, and one other person, uh, me. Um, and then we're going to try to go through some cases, which I think, um, and we really haven't scripted this, because I think what we wanted to do is really get a sense of how, as clinicians who treat patients with severe asthma, how we would approach this. And I think you're probably going to hear different points of view related to um, what, what might be done. And I think that's part of the educational experience. And we encourage you to um, also ask questions. Um, we can either do that at the end of each case or at the, um, certainly at the end of each case. Um, and we have three or four cases, depending on um, how, how this goes. So let me first. Um, um, make sure that, so we are, we are having a little bit of technical difficulty, so um, we're going to try to keep the slides that we have in front of us um, synced with the slides you have up there. So um, for anybody who wants to submit a quiz, uh, question today, you can text my phone um, at 617-645-0504. Um, and if you want CME credit, you can send your name, degree, and your email address to chrisfanta at partners.org, so cfanta at partners.org. And... What I think, okay, good. I just wanna make sure. So what we're, we're gonna talk about is management of severe asthma. Um, and we have Aiden Long, Nora Barrett, and myself, and I'll let Aiden introduce himself, and Nora introduce herself, and uh, I, I'll introduce myself as well. Simple country doctor. I work at uh, Mass General in allergy and immunology. Got a microphone, there we go. Uh, I work in uh, allergy and clinical immunology at Brigham and Women's Hospital. And uh, I'm Elite Israel, and I work in pulmonary critical care and allergy and immunology here at the Brigham. And so what we're going to do is we'll go right into these cases. Um, okay. So uh, conflicts of interest. Um, Nora has consulted for Generon. Aiden has uh, uh, no uh, conflicts. And um, these are all the places I um, have consulted with. Um, some of them make some of the products that you'll be hearing about, in particular... Um, AstraZeneca makes a anti-IL-5 known as Benralizumab. Um, Genentech makes an anti-IgE known as um, Zolair or Omalizumab. GlaxoSmithKline makes an anti-IL-5. Um, um, and um, uh, Santa Fe Regeneron makes an anti-IL-413 known as Dupilumab. And Teva makes an anti-IL-5 known as Rizumab. So case one, I'll read, um, <clears throat> and then I think we'll stop at particular cases and get a sense from the different panelists um, where they would go at different aspects of this. So um, the first case was a 16-year-old male with seasonal allergies, eczema, and peanut allergy, who was referred for worsening asthma. He had a lifelong history of asthma for all of his 16 years. He'd been treated with budesonide, for motorol, and Montelukas, but with the upper respiratory infections, he gets very severe shortness of breath that catches him by surprise. He's been told, um, he has been to the emergency room on a monthly basis this year, typically triggered by an upper respiratory infection or by forgetting his meds. And six of those um, cases, he's actually required, um, the emergency room felt that he should actually get a course of oral steroids. He has four sibs and a mother with severe asthma. He lives in Worcester within his extended family. The home is infested with cockroaches and mice. Um, his cat, which um, used to keep the mice away, triggers hives. He's a junior in high school. He smokes, he drinks alcohol weekly, he denies any drug use. On exam, he has turbinate edema, he has a normal lung exam. His spirometry went well, shows an FEV1, FEC ratio of 78% are predicted, an FEV1 that's 3.3, and FEC that's 4.23 liters. At an ER visit, his FEV1 ratio, VC ratio was reduced to 56%, with an FEV1 of 1.2, and an FEC of 2.14. He's undergone skin prick testing, and he was, alert, um, he was positive to decimite, cat, dog, birch, timothy grass, ragweed. And his total IgE was 453. So um, um, it, well, the first question I have um, for the panelists is, so Aiden, what's your strategy for the management of um, a poorly controlled asthmatic adolescent such as this one? So this is a, a teenage boy who's highly atopic, both with allergic rhinitis, asthma, peanut allergies, he has <coughs> 
known allergen exposures in his home. He has a history of brittle asthma with recurrent exacerbations, ER visits, steroid use, abnormal lung function. So he's a, he's a management problem. He's a history of non-compliance as well. I think you said when he forgets his meds. So there's a lot of issues to go through here. So when you're, when you're evaluating someone with severe asthma, I tend to think of five categories, categories I go through. Is there an environmental trigger? Clearly there are potential triggers here. He has allergen triggers. Cats in his home, probably dust mites. Mice in his home. He, ha he smokes cigarettes. That's an irritant trigger. Um, uh, does he have comorbidities? He has other atopic diseases, but not other diseases, unlike a chronic sinus disease based on the history. Um, so environmental exposures, comorbidities. Is it the wrong diagnosis? Unlikely, he has abnormal lung function compatible with asthma. In patients with normal lung function, you might think about other disorders such as vocal cord dysfunction, uh, other conditions. Um, is he compliant? That's the fourth issue, which is a problem here. And are there other bio, are there other medications that might be more suitable for him? He's on a combination steroid and long acting beta agonist. He's on a leukotriene inhibitor. He's not on an anticholinergic. So I'd go through those lists and try and address some of those problems to try and better control. Probably the biggest factor here, I would imagine, the biggest two factors are his allergen exposure and his non-compliance. Let's just talk then about allergen exposure because it gets, it gets a environmental control as a strategy gets a bad rap. Because the literature, when it's been studied, is not very supportive of environmental modification having a salutary outcome effect on asthma. Yet, as against that, there's clearly cases we all see where it makes an enormous difference. That with an environment control, they can control the symptoms. Without it, the symptoms recur. And um, I would put it that the, the studies done were not very well designed um, to show this effect. And by way of example, uh, in this month's, maybe last month's Journal of Allergy Symptomology, is a study of mouse allergen avoidance. Um, where <coughs> was done by Elizabeth, Elizabeth Matsui's group, and they looked at two interventions, uh, education or education plus pesticide control, and showed no difference in terms of asthma outcomes. Then in an editorial by Peyton Eggleston, the same journal, he said, if you relook at the data and look at those who achieve decrease in allergy and see whether that determines Improvement. There was a dramatic difference between those who effectively lowered the allergen and those who did. So environment control is a big issue here. Uh, that is invaluable. Nora, did you have any other um, comments or thoughts? Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, I would say that there's, um, I agree with everything that's been said so far in that Allergen avoidance is very difficult to achieve and requires a lot of partnering, which we're not always that well suited to do. I think. Uh, last night at one of the partners' asthma center get-togethers, we heard a lot about people who are working in inner city Boston to try to achieve that and doing home visits, which I think are probably not used enough, uh, we don't take enough advantage of. Um, I think that does exist in, you know, partnering with uh, inner cities, uh, you know, support system out in Worcester or in Boston or whatever, or really a an untapped sometimes resource where um, there there might be significant funds set aside in order for people to do a kind of hard monitoring and cleanup and, and uh, look. Uh, this patient, I think, uh, my, my read on them is, you know, they're living with extended family and not with their own immediate family and that there were seemingly a lot of environmental challenges. Uh, I think that is a major consideration when I'm thinking about medications um, and whether someone's gonna be able to be adherent with something. I'm very apt to take, if there are classes of medicines that they're already on, to try to winnow that down into one inhaler, if it's a three-part combined or whatnot, if that's possible, if I think those are effective medicines for the patient. So that's one financial strategy. And trying to work on that. 16-year-olds uh, require a lot of partnering with their parents or extended family members. And at least as I'm getting older now, I think it is helpful to have, when you're dealing with people who are 15, 16, and younger, to try to do some kind of outreach where they really feel connected to your office, um, whether that's to, you know, to help regular adherence for medications, but also PRN kind of stuff. So 
you know, there's, um, we've all, I think probably in this room who take care of asthma been involved in some of the trials of asthma apps. Mm, I don't think, you know, we don't have our own that's come to fruition here within the partners um, institution that we, you know, regularly use. Um, there are other ones that are widely available that I use with people all the time where they can literally set an email reminder to take your once daily inhaled steroid and long acting beta agonist um, to ring them. I'm not sure that it, uh, well, yeah, you know, we don't know whether how effective that always is, but I think yeah, connecting with them and having them also connect either with fellows or with some of the MAs in our clinic actually I think helps a lot. Um, and also, I don't primarily speak Spanish, so where that's a, that that can be a huge issue with some patients. So I think that making sure that um, it is a huge resource and recognizing that if there's anybody in your office who speaks Spanish, it is incredibly helpful. It's not just about having a translator in the room to kind of translate during the middle of a visit, but actually having somebody as they shovel them in and shovel them out who can relate to them in a more easy way, I think is really helpful. Yes, that um, actually we should be using a formoterol inhaled corticosteroid um, for all patients as their PRN inhaler. Um, would this be somebody who, when you talked about adherence, would this be somebody where you'd consider saying, gee, I'm never going to get this kid to do twice a day or once a day anything regularly, um, and maybe um, I should give a shot of um, saying, here's your um, formoterol inhaled corticosteroid. Use this, and I'm taking away your albuterol. I think that's an excellent point. Um, for the sake of CME, we have to state that to say that that's not an approved use of this medication in this country, but the studies have clearly shown. Uh, so it's not an approved use of that medication in this country, but there's clearly data supporting that, in that it does achieve um, better control of asthma at the overall outcome of less steroid use. Um, so it's clearly something worth considering. I can't think of an asthmatic who I've taken away their pro air from <laughs> so far. Sounds bold. I think um, the other piece that we haven't touched base on yet, it's probably not the first five things one would do with this patient, but if one was able to achieve a little bit more regular control is to think about allergen immunotherapy um, in somebody who's young, who's going to have lifelong uh, issues with asthma um, and where you might have the opportunity to make a much more significant difference for them and not have them uh, not deal with the issues of uh, med adherence. Of course, that involves capturing someone's attention for, uh, you know, uh, a long, yeah, a long course, and also would require you managing their lung function and making sure uh, over multiple visits that they had an FEV1 of at least 70% predicted and 70 <coughs> delay by it so that you're comfortable doing it. I, I think that's a really important point, and again, referring to the new NAPP guidelines, um, they emphasize the point that um, allergen immunotherapy really should only be administered to patients who are stable. So the data on allergy immunotherapy as a modality for asthma treatment is quite interesting. There's a number of small trials, several analyses of those trials, the Cochrane Review, all suggesting favorable outcomes. In terms of some outcomes, in terms of symptom control, medication use, and um, change in bronchial hyperreactivity. Not in terms of improvement of lung function, not in terms of improvement uh, uh, decrease in exacerbation rate. But there's one other study showing that in children it seems to prevent progression from allergic rhinitis to passion. It's not relevant here. Um, but as against that, to Elliot's point, those who do badly with immunotherapy uh, do very badly. And so you're kind of between 
rock in a hard place. And the evidence is not that it's a great parity, it's an adjunctive parity. Well worth considering a part of overall management, yeah. but specific for asthma, I'd be a bit cautious. Yeah, and I, I think I might be cautious again with, with the severe asthmatic, I think it's because of what you're saying, and, um, and this person isn't, a, isn't stable, um, and I, I think the data in severe asthma are um, not as good as the data in mild asthma and symptom control. But let's um, press and uh, should we go on? Um, so um, the patient, did I skip one? Okay. So the patient regularly fills his medications and begins omelizumab with success for several years and is then lost to follow up. Which is a strategy we didn't talk about. <laughs> right. Right. So we didn't talk about the fact that, so, um, well, let's. Um, We'll, we'll come back to that and, um, and, and why, um, why that might have been a very good strategy um, in this pe person. So four, four years later, he presents to an outside ED with hypercarbic respiratory failure and is intubated. He's unable to be ventilated despite high-dose methylprednisolone, heliox, terbutylene, ketamine, and epidrips. This is a lot of stuff they tried. And he's placed on extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. After a complicated course, including tracheostomy, decannulation, and a long rehabilitation, he returns to your clinic. Um, and so before we get into this, uh, the issues of um, who's a high-risk asthmatic, um, uh, do you want to talk a little bit about um, the strategy that was done in this case where the patient was put on um, anti-IgE? Uh, I think it makes an infinite amount of sense for all of the reasons why we were discussing how difficult environmental control can be and how, regular you can watch, how regularly you can watch someone who has asthma develop an have an exposure and, and really tank their lung function. Uh, and so uh, omalizumab uh, can, we think about it, of course, in people who are age six and over. Um, it, so it's uh, available for people at this, um, you know, for teenagers and can really reduce the uh, frequency of uh, exacerbations and also reduce day-to-day -day symptoms. So in this patient where their asthma is not just T2 asthma, but where their asthma seems particularly environmentally driven, um, uh, at least according to the history, it seems to make a lot of sense. Might not also be bad for... In someone who's non-adherent, this actually is an interesting strategy. Right. You can get him in for his, I would guess it's every two week therapy, or maybe every month therapy he would need. It has been shown to work well in severe asthma. Too much for lung function. Yeah, no, I, I, I personally, I'll say that it, um, it, it pains me in the sense that um, we end up having to put some patients on these very expensive um, biologics because they're non-adherent. But on the other hand, for some patients, that's the only thing that potentially sometimes saves their lives. And so, um, you know, I, I think it's not unreasonable in a case where you just can't get the adherence um, and to think about um, these therapies. Now, the other piece of this is this person um, was adherent for a while, but it looks like eventually stopped actually using his omelizumab um, and uh, came in and got intubated and um, almost died, right? Um, and so, you know, um, did this patient, we should maybe talk a minute about high-risk asthma patients and who you have to worry about um, in terms of characteristics of high-risk asthma. And there are a bunch of characteristics of patients who are at high risk for um, hospitalization, intubation, and death. Um, and those patients include patients who have a new diagnosis of asthma. So people within the first year of a new diagnosis of asthma are considered at high risk. Patients who've been intubated, this patient had not been intubated. Patients who have poor socioeconomic support, and this patient, I think, might have fallen to that. Patients with drug abuse um, are also patients um, who um, have that. Patients who've been hospitalized in the, within the past six months are also um, at high risk. And are there other um, things you would add to that list? There are other what they call minor things, like cigarette smoking, which he did, uh, ongoing allergen exposure, which he did, and poor lung function or poor control, which he did have even at... When he was put work well, he had an abnormal FDG one of the And depression is another, um, an, another um, so people who are depressed are also at high risk. Imagine Nora's point about the very 
difficult social socioeconomic environment is a huge factor there. Yeah. Um, just to, to keep ourselves a little bit on time, maybe we'll. Oh, sure. Um, let, let's talk about um, this next. Any, any questions about this case from the audience? Occurred to me as you're presenting it. Could the fact that he was put on a biologic and did well for a long time contribute to his sort of laissez-faire? Eventual outcome, he felt so good, stopped relying on medication, stopped using them, and suddenly ended up in a terrible situation. Unintended consequences? Um, yeah, yes, possibly, although one does the best one can. I mean, one certainly, um, I, I'm sure you've run into this, um, with using the biologics, I've had patients who have been on steroids for many years and have not been able to come off their biologic, come off their steroids, and suddenly they feel so well, um, and they come in, and they've been on 20 milligrams of prednisone for five years, and suddenly they're on zero, um, and then they say, but you know, I did go to the emergency room last, um, um, last month for exhaustion. <laughs> um, and so, um, and thank goodness it was just that, right? But um, adrenal crisis is real. So we do have unintended consequences, no matter how much um, we try to do this. Um, one point that, again, trying to bring everybody into the most current things, um, this patient was on Montelukast. Um, um, the FDA uh, today, or yesterday, um, revised their warning about Montelukast. You wanna talk about that at all, or? Right, so there's now a black box warning on Montelukast. Was it a black box? I, I knew it was there a warning. Will, there will be a black box on the Montelukast uh, because of the cases of suicide um, that have been reported. We don't have a lot of data to bear on this because it is uh, very infrequent. Um, in my experience, I would, it broader sense, I would say I've seen neuropsych, what I would regard as neuropsychiatric complications of it. Many patients report vivid dreams and other things, and I think it's probably more common in depression rather than suicidality. Um, and in, the medicine is, you know, highly, I would say that medicine is highly effective in probably smaller subsets of patients than we do in the So it, I think it bears consideration, careful consideration about when you're going to do it. And of course, uh, disclosure now that we really should um, be giving to patients when we're, when we're giving it out. The question is, should we I should identify patients who are currently on and advise them? I think the terminology is box warning rather than black box. Uh, okay. So how does how is this you know so in severe asthma, let's be honest, um, there's a kitchen sink approach in in the fact that we'll add things which we think have low morbidity, um, and so leukotriene modifiers. If the patient's not on it, frequently get added. Should we be thinking about modifying that? As Nora says, we have to let the patients okay. know that it has this warning, and then it will be a joint decision, I would guess. Okay. We are investigating at uh, partners for sure of um, being able to identify everybody through the EMR and send out warnings. Okay, so the second case, a 47-year-old woman referred for severe asthma. She had lifelong mild intermittent asthma. Yep. Okay, um, and in her 20s, it became more frequent and severe. She's had more than 20 hospitalizations, so that's a hospitalization almost every year. She began using oral corticosteroids multiple times a year. Her outside pulmonologist has measured her FV1. Her high is two and a half liters when well. Her low is less than one liter. Next slide. Her symptoms are chest tightness, congested cough, and wheeze. She improves with albuterol nebulizers. When you ask her about her triggers, she says everything, including cold air, exercise, sinus problems, cat, dust, chemical stress, and change in the season. Laughing causes her to wheeze. She's on fluticasone cell meterol, 550 BID. She's on teotropium daily. She's on Montelukast daily, and she's on 10 milligrams of prednisone. So what features of the history in the exam informs your thinking about adult onset asthma or asthma with very significant worsening in adulthood? Nora, what are your thoughts there? Uh, when we are looking at these patients, I think uh, for sure in adult onset asthma, we're uh, wondering whether this is actually a T2 high or low or a... Um, group that's not associated with atopic dermatitis, food allergy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we're always focused on thinking about, is there uh, an occupational trigger? Thinking about adult onset occupational asthma. Is, is this a case of aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease? Because those are our two phenotypes for adult onset that are so clear um, and, and easy to kind of elicit. I think much more common we see or I see is this type of a case where someone has a mild history or they were bronchial as a kid or something like that. It's not perfect. 
um, and you think, are thinking actually, well, maybe this actually was undiagnosed asthma or really trivial asthma, and this is a really dramatic worsening in it, in which case I think a lot about what are the environmental exposures that they have, or are there, is there a particular piece, an exposure that might lead to um, or be associated with something like ABPA, or did they have a very severe respiratory infection prior to the onset of dramatic worsening, um, and we might be actually missing the diagnosis. Um, I always in adults, we would always get a chest x-ray at minimal for uh, adult onset asthma, um, and then think through very carefully whether that's actually the diagnosis. So, some, so, a little, so you were worried about other things like aspirin-sensitive asthma, occupational asthma, and you're also worried about whether that's the diagnosis. Yeah, that's the diagnosis. In this case, you know, sometimes it will be a little bit less clear than this, uh, a little bit less data than this. Uh, but, you know, sometimes I've seen patients where you'll, they have a respiratory symptom which has been driving increasing inhaler use, but actually what they have is reflux. Not reflux driving asthma, just reflux. <laughs> you know? So I think that there are other diagnoses that sometimes uh, are you know, very difficult for people to distinguish between. Aiden, are there other things that you agree with that? Um, the people are saying they can't hear you. Um, so. Okay, so I do agree with what Nora said. I think thinking of alternative diagnoses or comorbidities. I don't know if you mentioned upper airway disease or sinus disease, but that absolutely you should think about it. Look at it. Uh, is, there, is there sinus disease? Is it AERD? Is it chronic sinusitis? Acid reflux disease. So comorbidities that may be contributing to worsening asthma. Yeah, and, and certainly, you know, um, the, the data seems to suggest that up to 50% with si of patients who have sinus disease contributing to their asthma don't have sinus symptoms. Um, so as opposed to reflux, where the data seems to suggest that if you're not having symptomatic reflux, it's unlikely that that's really making your asthma poorly controlled. Um, I think for sinus disease, I frequently find when we start investigating these people that there's actually significant sinus disease with the patients being unaware that um, they have such significant sinus disease. Yeah, I would just say that I do, I can count on one hand the number of people who are, I was very convinced where reflux was causing their asthma to be worse. That's very different than the number of people who have chest symptoms, which turn out to be reflux, and it's not driving any asthma, it's just right. reflux in a patient yeah. with asthma. Yeah, so let's advance to the next slide. So the, um, so this past medical history, um, he had chronic rhinus sinusitis with nasal polyposis. He had GERD. He had weight problems. He had recurrent bronchitis, knee problems, no eczema, no food allergies. He has no sibs of parents with asthma. He's a unremarkable social environmental history. He doesn't smoke, no pets, no inhaled exposure at work or home. He's obese. He has bilateral nasal polyposis, end inspiratory squeaks and pops, end expiratory wheezed diffusely. His FV1 FEC ratio is low at 56%. His FV1 is 1.2 liters. His FVC is about 2.1 liters. And after albuterol, he reverses. His FV1 goes up 0.5 liters to 1.7 liters. Um, and, and then to the next. Um, a chest x-ray is unremarkable. His peripheral blood eosinophil count is 700. His IgE is 118. His RAS testing is negative. His exhaled nitric oxide is quite high at 84. And so the question is, what are the next steps for this patient with eosinophilic asthma? And we might hear some differing opinions here. <laughs> so. so I think um, we, need to look, we need to consider that his sinus disease is contributing. And I think Nora's point about whether this is AERD is a really important one to think about. I don't know whether you mentioned the history. You mentioned knee problems, but did you mention treatment for his knee problems? No, no. That's the point of history we really need to establish. And the question would come up, does the history establish the diagnosis of AERD, or do you need to do an aspirin challenge? Um, this is a dream situation. Fidelia, the <laughs> primordial clinical asthma researcher, Nora, primar prim primordial basic science and geography. We talk about AERD. This is my dream job. Um, I don't think an aspirin challenge would be necessary if you got a convincing history. I think that would bring you to that diagnosis. Okay. If it's not aspirin sensitive, is it? Are there other aspects of chronic sinus disease? Um, that okay. Make and let's assume as, as it was aspirin positive, or he gave you a very good history for aspirin sensitivity. What would you want to do? Nice. He has AERD. Then think about treatment. 
So right, what treatment would and you want? So treatment options include managing his asthma optimally, managing his sinus disease optimally. Would you consider aspirin desensitization? Would you consider biologics these days to approach that? Um, there is evidence that aspirin desensitization is effective. No doubt about it. It's effective more so for the sinus disease than the asthma, I believe. Uh, since this patient's problem is primarily, primarily asthma, I think I'd probably think about biologic therapy before aspirin desensitization. Would, would we need him to see any NT doctor and do consider sinus surgery before starting that? I think before aspirin desensitization therapy, maybe. If we're going to a biologic, I'm not clear anymore. It would be, historically, we would involve the NT. If we're going to a biologic such as bupivimab, I'm not sure that it would anymore. Nora, what's your take? Yeah, I would, uh, it would be very similar. Uh, I would say a couple things. It's not infrequent that people don't know that they have any aspirin sensitive history. So in that case, I would still say, even though we probably do less aspirin desenses now in 2020 than we used to, I still think establishing the diagnosis is helpful if it's unclear because there are clearly patients, 10 to 20% of which won't recognize that they're aspirin sensitive. And so it's helpful to get that. So we still do some aspirin challenges, but I do many fewer aspirin desensitizations now, not the least of which is because it's actually hard to maintain and there's significant side effects like GI and whatnot, which at a certain point uh, rival the side effects of biologics um, and the, the cost benefit ratios will be a little bit less clear. Um, so I think that these days, I agree that if you're going to do an aspirin desensitization, it primarily, it, the, the very clear data is for improvement in um, nasal symptoms. The respiratory symptoms and symptom score in studies looking at symptom scores are, are improved. Um, but there's less clear data for um, uh, hospitalizations or other hard kind of asthma endpoints. Um, and now for biologics, we have some of that data. And so uh, I would be probably uh, more prone to go with uh, biologic than I would be for Yeah. Could I just ask Nora to uh, uh, expand this idea of doing an aspirin challenge rather than a desensitization? Mm -hmm. Well, what have you learned, other than to tell the patient to avoid NSAID, what have you learned by the aspirin challenge? Uh, I, so, I mean, that they can take NSAIDs. I mean, it's a huge class of medications. And uh, I, I think we don't net yet know, if you commit to a biologic, we don't yet know whether you can do an aspirin challenge afterward to make a diagnosis. Now. A biologic doesn't have to be a lifetime commitment, of course, so one could take somebody off of that later in order to establish that if you need to. But it's also a very inconvenient thing to try to do in the setting of somebody having acute pain or chronic pain or whatnot, and especially in the era of kind of uh, the opioid crisis and whatnot, I think it actually becomes more and more important to actually like, establish that as a diagnosis. So I think for that reason, um, I still am very interested in establishing the diagnosis. It's very hard to get somebody in the room for an aspirin challenge acutely when they have a problem and the whole clinic you know, booking out six months. So, so I like to establish it up front, but um, if, it's, if it's possible and reasonable. Um, and then, but then what you, and, you know, later we may find that that does direct your ideas about biologics. I don't think we have that date yet. So um, I, I think this landscape is changing and certainly the, you know, here where their um, desensitization was readily available. I think there was a tendency, is a t has been a tendency to desensitize and to do what you're talking about, send them to ENT. Um, I, I think that um, other than in the case of when there's issues with pain and pain management, um, my tendency is to think now that um, we have a therapy and, um, you know, and, and I assume that for instance, this patient's been put on a leukotriene antagonist um, and or a 5 lipoxidase inhibitor um, with, with a failure. Assuming this person has aspirin sensitivity, gets treated with a 5 lipoxidase inhibitor and a leukotriene antagonist, and still has a, um, still is having her, her hospitals, hospitalizations um, and um, still um, is ill, um, that um, one, could, one would treat those patients whether they had aspirin sensitivity or not, probably with a biologic. Um, the data, I think, are accumulating rapidly that um, biologic therapy is probably as good or better than aspirin desensitization. Um, in many cases, those patients are also um, having significant reduction of their sinus symptoms. Um, 
And I'm almost wondering whether the, we need to kind of reverse things. And then if only if they're failing on the biologic, then send them to ENT, as opposed to putting them through the ENT thing where, you no, know, I've always told um, patients who have polyps that um, ENT surgery is like mowing the grass. Um, it, it basically is guaranteed that you're going to grow back. I um, mean, yes, it's less of a grow back when you're in aspirin desensitization, but I think the biologics are really changing the face of um, aspirin sensitive asthma. I should advance to the next. So, this patient had an aspirin challenge um, at 40 milligrams, no reaction, 81 milligrams, nasal discharge, watery eye, and wheeze. A diagnosis of ARD is made, and I think we got ahead of ourselves in terms of um, how we would manage this person with ARD in 2020. So he declined aspirin desensitization um, because it bothered, it bothered her stomach, I'm sorry. Um, the physician files for dupilumab, which is a anti-IL-413, which has been shown um, to um, improve and actually has a FDA indication now for nasal polyps. Um, and how do you counsel the patient? And I think we've, um, um, the patient got started, right? Um, and the patient returns three months later feeling great. She has less nasal congestion. Her sense of smell and well-being is better. She has reduced cough and congestion wheeze. However, she finds that in the three days before her next injection, the symptoms begin to recur, and it feels to her like the medication's wearing off. Um, and Nora, you want to talk a little bit about um, this phenomenon and what you think you can do? Um, yep, tricky. So uh, I would say that we don't have a lot of data in this area. Most of the studies have shown that there was not a high incidence of developing of uh, blocking antibodies into any of the biologics. Uh, and so that would be, I was surprised to see this, but we um, see it from any of the biologics. We have seen it. Um, so whether patients are developing, assuming that there is not the development of blocking um, antibodies, uh, whether patients are developing kind of escape mechanisms for cases, or obviously all of the issues that cause asthma control to be off, including comorbidities and whatnot that we touched on earlier today, can of course happen here. Um, I think what the case is supposed to say, though, is that it, it clearly is that every three days before the next, it's quite um, quite clear. Um, in some cases, uh, it's possible that increasing the dose of a biologic um, would be a therapeutic approach or narrowing the window. Um, yeah, so I, I should say that we're, I think we're all seeing this. Um, so the biologics are extraordinarily effective in the appropriate patients, um, but we are certainly seeing patients who come in and say, this was unbelievable, but, you know, um, after three weeks and I'm supposed to wait four weeks, I feel like things are coming back and I can't wait for my next shot. Um, and in some patients, I've seen this begin to even narrow more and more where they initially say, three days, and they say five days, and then they say a week, and then they say a week and a half and two weeks. Um, and um, so it's, it's an interesting phenomenon. Um, I, I don't know that we have an answer. Um, what we've done is try to switch from one to the next, and it's not particularly that one solves this and the other doesn't. We've gone in, direct, in directions um, both ways. Um, and I, I think, um, and <clears throat> we have one patient where this was a successive pattern um, with each of the biologics, initially excellent responses and then waning times of response um, with um, all the biologics available. So um, I might just s talk about the flip side of that coin. We often see patients on biologics who do well. By the way, dupilumab has two recommended doses, 200 and 300. So I presume she's on the higher dose. I presume it's every two weeks as it's supposed to be. Um, and so with dupilumab, for example, in atopic dermatitis, we see excellent gain of control, and then patients who voluntarily increase the important dose. They don't feel they need it. And we see that sometimes with asthma, too. I don't want people to leave here thinking these things typically wear off. There may well be cases. I don't think I've seen this phenomenon, uh, but I have seen the other side of the phenomenon, where the, the duration of benefit is longer than the interval, recommended interval, interval of treatment. So, okay, and there, there was a question on the prior case um, about whether, remember that was the case with the um, boy, the 16 year old who wasn't adherent. Um, and um, the question was, do you see an advantage in using LABA ICS as PRN for this case? Um, and, you know, I think we, that might have come in just uh, before we talked about it, but, um, yeah, you know, I think that potentially that was a, um, a possible strategy for that case. 
Any questions about this last case, about that last case before we go on to this, what'll be our last case? Okay, so this case is a 51-year-old woman referred for severe asthma. She says she has lifelong asthma. She's had numerous hospitalizations. As a matter of fact, um, they're almost every month that she gets hospitalized for asthma. She's, intub she's been intubated three times. She has been disabled because of her asthma for the last 20 years, 30 years. Um, she's on continuous steroids for the last 15 years. She's unable to get below 35 milligrams a day before she has another exacerbation. Next slide. She has symptoms of chest tightness and wheeze. They're triggered by upper respiratory infections, cold air, exercise, odor, and animals. She's on QVAR 80 micrograms, two puffs twice a day, Dulera twice a day, Incruz Elipta, um, Zilutin 600 milligrams four times a day, Dalyrest 500 micrograms a day, Zopinex, Methylprednisolone 35 milligrams a day, Nebulized Chromalin four times a day, IVIG infusions, Bactrim because of her high dose um, prednisone, and um, twice a day Prevacid. <laughs> um, kitchen sink, um, allergies. Um, she says the prednisone itself, um, the regular prednisone gives her a rash and Benadryl gives her rash, swelling, difficulties breathing. She has been on omelizumab and found it to be unhelpful. Um, she's been on mepolizumab and found that not to be helpful. She has a history of adrenal insufficiency secondary to steroids. She has a diagnosis of bipolar disorder. She has diabetes, documented GERD, obesity, OSA on CPAP, hyperlipidemia, hypertension, hypothyroidism, hearing loss, neuropathy, a seizure disorder, a remote history of vulvar cancer, and no food allergies or eczema. Um, her father and a sibling have asthma. She has possible exposure at work um, to what she thought were inhalants that made her wheeze. She has a three-pack year smoking history. She has extensive secondhand smoke exposure as a child. And she has a cat and is allergic to cats. <laughs> uh, on exam, she has no polyps. She has a narrow UP opening consistent with her sleep apnea. She has coarse ronchi on exam. On labs, when you review the um, sky-high pile of, um, of records that come with her, you can only find an eosinophil count. The highest you can find is 110 that appears to be recorded off, off of prednisone. Her total Ig is 12, cystic fibrosis testing is normal. Okay, what would you do further in this patient? <laughs> so she's a sick <laughs> well, uh, patient with um, severe asthma, frequent exacerbations, a lot of comorbidities. Come to my clinic. <laughs> a lot of yeah. comorbidities. She seems to have somewhat of a, an atopic profile. She has cat allergy, cat exposure. She has other risk factors. She has obesity, smoking, she has a psychiatric history, you'd wonder about compliance, um, you'd wonder about alternative diagnoses, is this, uh, is there glottic dysfunction here, um, further workup, I'll let Nora answer that one. So I think when it's kind of impossible when someone first shows up and they have every possible comorbidity and every possible thing, I, my instinct um, is to have them come in for weekly appointments for free. When they come in for weekly appointments, if you can capture their attention, then that's a doable thing. That's what I like to do. Or have them. She lives in Western Massachusetts. Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, as people, as a fellow who rotate with me, know I like to use the ambulatory FEV1. If you think, oh, sorry. If you, can you hear me? If you think um, the patient can do it, and you can look at that in the office. Um, and see whether they that would be possible so that you could start to peel away one or two medicines. Because I think one thing that you have to say before we go further diagnostic workup is, what can you peel off? If something doesn't work and hasn't made a significant difference, then I would, then I would try to peel off. Um, one thing that I always find helpful, likely to be negative here, I guess, is exhaled nitric oxide. I think we've been you know, using it more and more. And I think some of the um, recent reviews, despite the fact that Pheno has been around for a long time and it's kind of much maligned for a period of time. I think there's enough studies. There's hundreds of studies looking at pheno now and there really is some clear areas where it can be quite helpful as far as what's, uh, as far as both diagnosing asthma and following asthma control, um, including if numbers are under 20, it's highly unlikely that you have a steroid responsive uh, disease and some other thing that we're gonna have to throw in that direction. And also on the flip side, you might be able to wean some of these things off and see whether you can follow some parameters like that and 
FEV1 and symptom scores or something like that. It's really challenging when these people are from far away. Uh, but I might try to do a little bit more dive in that. Also, I don't think we have a chest X-ray in the CT scan where, for sure, in this kind of patient, I'd, I'd want that. Yeah, so um, you know, my, my sense about these patients is you, um, I tell them I need to unpack them. Um, yeah. And it, it, is, it is, you know, and I said it's going to take a little while to do the unpacking. You have a very full suitcase. And, um, and it's a matter of um, making sure the diagnosis is really correct, uh, making sure that the comorbidities are not really pushing this and uh, making this a um, medication-resistant um, asthma and understanding what, what actually is driving um, this. So um, in this case, um, maybe the next slide. Um, so she has spirometry. Her FE1 was 75% of predicted. Her FEC was 90% of predicted. We sent her for lung volumes. The lung volumes are normal. Her pheno was 16, and I think um, Nora made the point that I think an, an, a pheno of, of less than 20 um, in, in a patient who's on therapy generally suggests that at least you're not dealing with uncontrolled um, airway eosinophilic inflammation. Um, I think phenos greater than 20, um, there's a suggestion based on anti-IgE data and probably also based on the IL-413 data that patients who are on um, even high-dose inhaled corticosteroids who have a pheno Actually, who are on inhaled corticosteroids of a pheno greater than 20 might still have um, type 2 inflammation. And normally, we're talking about the, if you talk about patient cutoffs for pheno, you know, the general cutoff is 50 for patients who are not on inhaled corticosteroids. Um, at least that's what the guidelines keep talking about. I, I don't find that to be the case in our populations where patients come in already treated. Um, so she had a sinus CT to make sure that she didn't have, and that was normal. She had a chest CT to be sure that we weren't dealing with anything else, and there were no significant findings. Next steps. <clears throat> Very difficult. So she has um, abnormal lung function. She has chronic symptomatic disease. You think about, she's on, I think you said she's on, so, so, so this may be non-T2 asthma, let's say, based on the low pheno and the regular use of steroids. You've controlled the T2 inflammation. Would you think about a T2 low type asthma? And what therapies might be helpful there? Um, I think you said she's on an anticholinergic. She is an anticholinergic, right? Macrolide therapy has some evidence that's not hugely effective, but certainly worth the try chronic macrolide therapy. Functional thermoplasty, you could think about that as a therapy here. So what's your thought about bronchial thermoplasty? Uh, <laughs> we don't have a lot of long-term outcomes in bronchial thermoplasty, and so um, and I know that there's an interest in continuing to collect data longitudinally to see how those patients fare. Um, I think uh, one's uh, interest in going down that route would, uh, in the era of effective biologics, uh, you know, my enthusiasm for it has really been um, diminished because of the efficacy of the biologics. Um, so it would, I would really only think about it in patients who, who I was pretty convinced were long type 2 high. I think um, maybe from the immunology perspective also in the non-type 2 high, I do get a fair, maybe this is Chris's training, I do get a fair amount of induced sputums on patients to make sure that there's not a germ or something else, especially in a patient, I think this patient was on IVIG, so presumptively they have either hypogammaglobulinemia or uh, a poor response to pneumococcal vaccination or some clear indication for that, um, which we didn't really talk about. And that can, you know, whether that's a glide or something, uh, I think I would look at. Yeah, and the, NAP, the NAPP update, one of the um, six questions they were asked was one related to bronchial thermoplasty. And again, in the draft guidelines, um, they've recommended against um, using bronchial thermoplasty except for um, as part of registries or clinical trials. Um, and I think they, I think all of us have this, we don't know yet if it's ready for prime time and that there are enough data um, and, and there's, a, there's a fair amount of concern about the upfront morbidity um, related to, to using um, that therapy. So if we go to the slide. Um, so um, to complete her evaluation, she had a VCD evaluation, which was normal because um, again, <clears throat> and she, even though she was on, on Prevacid, she had a pH probe just to make sure that this still was an uncontrolled um, reflux. We've certainly seen patients who, despite um, high-dose PPIs, continue to have reflux. 
Okay. Her, just to stop, so you can have non-acid reflux. So the PPI will turn off acid production. It doesn't change the reflux, and non-acid contents can contribute to. Excellent point. And actually, now we're we're sending patients for the combined studies, right? We're not just sending them for a pH probe. Um, and so, next steps. So um, I think you said you'd consider um, a. Um, macrolidum. So in this case, um, I think there was concern um, about what was really going on and whether it's T2 inflammation was being missed, even with the pheno being low. Um, so this patient underwent a bronchoscopy to actually ascertain what was going on in her airway wall. On her airway wall, she had minimal goblet cell metaplasia, mild mucosal edema. All her cultures were negative, to your, to your point, because um, it's sometimes very hard to get induced sputum on these patients. They um, you know, these are, these are the, the most severe patients are the ones where you're a little worried about the induced sputum. Um, and her BAL showed 5% neutrophils, which isn't particularly high, but no eosinophils. So no eosinophils in the airway wall and no eosinophils. Um, so where do you go from here? So she, um, so therapeutic options. So she started on azithromycin um, and she had no improvement. What would you consider an appropriate duration of treatment? For, for that, like um, I, I generally go two to three months. Two months. Uh, I have probably only one patient I've ever started on Theophil, and I've inherited a few. That's another question. I wonder when you ever use it. Um, I, don't, I can't remember when I last prescribed Yeah, so I, uh, ditto. I, I cannot remember the last time I prescribed Theophil. And I, you know, I, um, I know that there are theoretical reasons that it might have um, effects other than um, smooth muscle effects, I've not seen them. <laughs> um, and we used to use so much of it, um, I just have not seen it. And, and many, many years ago, I would try it as an adjunctive treatment and never found that it really added anything. And, and keeping the dose ranging um, was interesting, unless you subscribe to using low dose, which some people do, but again, found that not to be helpful. I don't know if members of the audience have, have a different experience. So, um, so she was started on imatinib, um, 400 milligrams a day, um, and her exacerbations dropped to three per year. She's still having exacerbations, but she's down to three per year. Um, we've used that in, you know, the, the data for, um, Ifermatinib, um, there are now actually just was a study with the mesitinib, which is another kit inhibitor. So these block mast cell um, activation and actually cause um, mast cells to involute um, because they block stem cell factor. Um, the data are interesting in that, um, at least in the New England Journal article, um, the improvement in um, methylcholine responsiveness and FEV1 were most in the patients who were least eosinophilic. Um, and so that's why we thought this might be something effective for her. Um, and so that's what was um, done here. But I think there are a lot of different ways to skin this cat. Yeah. I was gonna say, how long do you keep patients on a matinib before you decide whether it's helpful or not? Again, I, I'd give most things three months. I, yeah, I think that's, that's all you get. <laughs> um, that, that, so that's... In the New England Journal paper, the, the paper from here, from the Brigham, yeah. the patients appeared to be alert. They had elevated eosinophils, they had elevated pheno by and large, they had positive skin tests, they had a high IgE. And since it's a mast cell active agent, it seemed to make sense in that group. I'm not sure it would, why it would make sense in the group who don't seem to. So there, there was a di wide distribution. They weren't chosen based on that. So there's actually a wide distribution. Um, and that's the, um, one of the figures in there actually showed that um, if you look at um, eosinophils, um, so blood eosinophils, um, the lower the blood eosinophils, the greater the response. Um, and when you looked at the BAL, because those patients underwent bronchoscopy, the higher the neutrophils in the bronchoscopy, the greater the response. So a little bit counterintuitive, although there are animal models actually that suggest that in the face of um, use of corticosteroids, because the, the other piece of this is that uh, many of these patients, I think, are probably initially type two or mixed type two and, um, and non-type two. And in many cases, these patients are on high dose inhaled corticosteroids. Um, we're suppressing their type two inflammation and they still have symptoms. So you just, just because type two can cause asthma doesn't mean it's the only cause of asthma. 
um, and, that it, and that you can't get non-type 2 with type 2. And I think what we're seeing in many of these cases, because we don't put, everybody gets inhaled corticosteroids, I think we're converting some of these type 2 high phenotypically to appear as type 2 low because, because that we've taken care of their type 2 inflammation, but they continue to have symptoms. And I think that's potentially what we're seeing, and that's what that the mouse model suggests potentially where mast cells which are not that sensitive to corticosteroids persist. So maybe that's what's activating those patients. Yeah, question from the audience. Yeah. Um, so the question just uh, to, to repeat, was this patient was obese, would you consider referring this patient for, uh, um, for bariatric surgery. Um, so I think that in tremendous morbid obesity, um, that's certainly a possibility. There are, there are data showing that um, obesity is associated with increased IL-6. IL-6 is associated with poor control and asthma. Um, the, and there are clearly patients who do much better when you do bariatric surgery. Um, it's not without its risks or complications, especially in people who are on chronic steroids. Um, but I think that's something certainly to consider. I got a question from the, on the phone. Um, thoughts on oral albuterol? Oral beta-2 agonists, um, I don't think they had, I'm not sure they had anything additional <laughs> over inhaled beta agonists. They do cause more side effects. We used to use oral terbutaline quite a bit, but like we don't use theophylline much anymore because of side effects. It, to me, it falls into that category. Okay, question from the audience. Response to imatinib. So, so the it was a small study. So there was there was a suggestion that um, higher triptases, um, patients with higher triptases were more responsive, but it didn't achieve significance. <coughs> okay, I think we reached the out into the hour. Um, I want to thank um, Nora and Aiden, um, and thank the audience, um, and um, thank you for people who are listening on the WebEx.